The Shakespeare Stealer, Chapter 5. You might sit down, Simon Bass said, before you fall down. I sank into an upholstered chair, but, but I thought you thought the one you brought, who brought you here was to be your master, Bass shrugged. Falconer is not the most communicative of men, nor the most genial, but he is reliable and effective. I could not go to Yorkshire myself because, well, for various reasons. He got you here in one piece at any rate. I mostly, Bass chuckled. Neither is Falconer the most considerate of traveling companions, I warrant. Have you eaten? Hi. Good, good. He shoved his papers aside, took up a pipe, and filled the bowl with it with tobacco from an earthenware jar. Then, we can get right down to business. You'll be wanting to know what's expected of you. I, though my seat was comfortable, I shifted about nervously. Very well. He went to the fireplace, touched a taper to a live coal, and lit the pipe. The first thing I expect is that you say yes rather than I. Your task will not require you to speak over much, but I'd as soon you did not brand yourself as a complete rustic. Understood? I, I mean yes. Excellent. His manner, which had become prickly, turned cordial again. Now, when you go to London, London? Yes, yes, London. It's a large city to the south of here. I can that, but let me finish then ask questions. When you go to London, you will attend a performance of a play called The Tragedy of Hamlet, Prince of Dis Denmark. You'll copy it in Dr. Bright's charactery, and you will deliver it to me. Now, any questions? I scarcely knew where to begin. I, well, how, that is, they will not object. The men who present the play, only if they discover you, naturally you'll be as surreptitious as possible. And, and they do discover me, I asked, thinking of the sermon copying affair. Bass blew out a cloud of smoke, which made me cough. <coughs> The Globe's audience is customarily between 500 and 1,000. Do you suppose they can watch over every member of it? I wish not. You wish not? Of course they can't. You will use a small table book, easily concealed. He rummaged through the riot of papers on his writing desk. You see how easily it is concealed? Even I can't find it. Finally, he came up with a bound pad of paper in the size of his hand. There, keep it in your wallet. You have a plumbago pencil? I, yes. Any further questions? And I might ask, for what purpose am I to do this? Bass turned a penetrating look on me. Does it matter? No, I was not. I was only curious. He nodded and scratched the balding top of his head. You'll know sooner or later, I suppose. He puffed thoughtfully at his pipe and then continued. I am a man of business, Widge, and one of my more profitable ventures is a company of players. They are not nearly so successful as the Lord Chamberlain's or the Admiral's men, but they do a respectable business here in the Midlands. As they have no competent poet of their own, they make do with hand-me-downs, so well used as to be threadbare. If they could stage a current rook by a poet of some reputation, they could double their box. Box? The money they take in and my profit would also double. Now someone, sooner or later, will pry this tragedy of Hamlet from the hands of its poet, Mr. Shakespeare, just as they did Romeo and Juliet and Titus Andronicus. He jabbed his pipe stem at me for emphasis. 
I would like it to be us, and I would like it to be now, while it is new enough to be a novelty. Besides, if we wait for others to obtain it, they will do a botched job, patched together from various sources, none of them reliable. Mr. Shakespeare deserves better. He is a poet of quality, perhaps of genius, and if his work is to be appropriated, it ought to be done well. It, it, that is your mission. If you fulfill it satisfactorily, the rewards will be considerable. If you do not, he gave a wry smile. Well, Falconer will make sure that you do. The anticipation that had been growing in me turned suddenly sour. I, I did not Kenna would go with me. Bass laughed. Did you, you suppose that I would send you off to London on your own? You can't even speak the language properly. I might just as well send you to Guiana. He patted one of my sagging shoulders. Don't look so inconsolable. Falconer will take good care of you, and you can learn a lot from him. Besides, looking on the bright side, this time you'll have a horse of your own. So, the room that was to be mine for two nights only. Oh, so the room that was to be mine was mine for two nights only. The following morning we set out for London. Though my legs had not quite recovered, by shortening my stirrups and leaning back in the saddle I could ride without too much discomfort. Naturally, Falconer set a brisk pace. Mr. Bass had no doubt instructed him not to delay, and he, in his fanatical fashion, took this to mean that we should drive our mounts and ourselves to exhaustion. It was bet I was better fed this time, for Libby had provided me with all manner of victuals, fruit, meat pies, clabbered. She had also found time to wash and mend my workaday clothing and patch my torn shoe. When I thanked her, she had waved my words away. <laughs> it's no more than is expected of me. Don't go getting yourself into trouble in the city now. Trouble? I thought, in London. Ever since I could remember, I'd heard Dr. Bright and others speak of London in tones usually reserved for talk of the heavenly city. As the earth was the center of the greater universe, so London was the center of our miniature universe. And I, Widge, orphan and lowly apprentice, was moving toward that center. Sore legs be damned. I dug my heels into my horse's ribs and urged her into a gate that, for a short time, outstripped even Falconer. I'd gone no more than a mile when a hare scampered from the brush and across the roadway. My mount reared, nearly spilling me from the saddle. Falconer came abreast of me. What's the trouble? he demanded. A hare, I said, shaken. I ran across me path. That's all? From your face, anyone would have guessed it was a dragon, at least. Do not ken it's a bad omen. I take no stock in omens. Men make their own fates. Not prentices, I muttered. I urged my horse forward, but not with quite the same eagerness as before. And that's the end of chapter five. Until next time, may the Lord bless you and keep you May he make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and grant you his shalom.